Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about digital and media production. Second hour is usually something we want to talk a little bit more about, in spe specifically. Um, David Paskett will be here today, and he's going to be talking about Keynote, and um, I'm going to forget the, the second one. <laughs> Canva. I I had it. Well, sorry, Canva. <laughs> sorry, Keynote and Canva. I, I've been really thinking about Keynote a lot because uh, this is the anniversary. Uh, I think um, over the weekend was the 20th anniversary since uh, since um, Keynote was released. And so I was I was like, what a great week to talk about Keynote and Canva and Canva. Um, but uh, it was a great, great week. A lot of anniversaries because Keynote was uh, announced as well as the iPhone. Um, so, um, so it really, it's an interesting, uh, interesting week as far as uh, anniversaries go. 16 years ago for the iPhone, I think. Um, all right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitchell, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. Hope you're staying dry. First question in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Color RGB send changes when Apple remote desktop closed. Color HDMI out is normal when Apple remote desktop is actively remote controlling, then drops the red channel when closing the remote de desktop. Thoughts and thanks. I don't know if it's dropping the red channel as I think what might look like dropping the red channel is somehow changing its interpretation from RGB to YUV because that would make it that would look similar. So um, I think that I think that that's what's happening. I don't have I don't have an answer. I, I just don't think it's dropping the red channel. I think it's changing its color mode. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I'm not sure about the Apple. On Windows, when you go into remote control desktop, it drops down to 8-bit color uh, to reduce the amount of bandwidth needed to send the graphics in real time. Uh, so maybe it has something to do with that. The The bit depth is changing and it's not changing back or it's misinterpreting when it goes from 8-bit to 16-bit from palletized color to actual real true color. And I wonder whether you're using a... I think that you may want to think about what what's going into the HDMI as well. So you may want to think about um, well. That, that's what we'd like to know is what are you connecting it to? Because you you may be just using a dummy HDMI, which may do. It. You may need something more complex that basically looks at the EDID and keeps telling it what it's getting. So rather than just being a dummy display that sits on the other side, you may need something a little bit more. If you're trying to get color out of it, that that's one thing that comes to mind but yeah I, yeah I'd, be like, I'd like to know what what you're connected to on the other end um, and what you're seeing how you're seeing it change uh, next question John Snyder from Reno Nevada what's the best way to clean teleprompter glass good Courtney well the best method given to me by the guy who made all of my teleprompter glass who did the coatings uh, was isopropyl alcohol diluted in uh, pure distilled water uh, and a soft lint-free cloth. Make sure you don't get any dust or scraping and you blow it off first to get the big dust particles off. And then you can, if you have oil smudges or something from people touching it with their oily fingers, then alcohol, the alcohol water solution will uh, clean it up and evaporate without leaving smudges. Don't use Windex or anything that has ammonia in it. I, I saw that this morning. I saw that question this morning. I was like, I have no idea what the right answer is. And I was like, oh, Courtney's here. Like, <laughs> there's going to there's be one person that knows the answer to that. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, listen to Courtney. I will tell you, I made a mistake early. Instead of buying pure isopropyl or denatured, which I used to use for cleaning my tape heads, I made a mistake and bought rubbing alcohol. Occasionally, rubbing alcohol has oils put into it to soften skin. That is not bueno for cleaning glass. <laughs> Just letting you know. <laughs> Now, now, Courtney, when you say blow on it, do you use one of those like rocket, like the the, the blowers to to do it? Yeah, well, we use canned air too. You know, uh -huh. you know, that's I don't think you can get up high enough velocity for a piece of dust to harm the glass with a right. canned air. But but yeah, canned air to blow them off and then uh, get the smudges off with the alcohol. Perfect. Next question. Next question in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. How do you add non Adobe fonts to Adobe Premiere? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. And uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, any type of font that uh, you can drop into your operating system, whether it's Mac or PC, um, will work as long as it gets into the system. And the other trick is if you have Premiere open and you drop the font in uh, while you have Premiere open, Premiere won't know about that font until you do a restart. Uh, has to rebuild all the preferences. And be very careful of putting Comic Sans in. It might cause a computer to explode. 
Go ahead, Jesse. Um, I'm doing this in Ventura, so it'll look a little bit different when you do it in Monterey, but basically you get your font, double click it to open. It'll take a minute to check that it can be installed. Once the font is validated, you install it and you should be able to go. Hopefully this works. Old. Uh, where was it, that old I, newspaper? Old typewriter. You should be able to, to load it up immediately now in the newest versions of Adobe. Oh, interesting. Now go ahead, Sky. And again, there's an app on the on the Macintosh systems called uh, Font Book, and that will keep your all of your fonts nicely organized and tell you if there's conflicts or, or issues. And the other th issue is what type of font are you downloading that is a non Adobe font? I know there are both the True Type and Open. Is it Open? What's it called? Shoot, uh, Open Type. And I've had some that just didn't want to work. Now I've again. The the real key is often restarting your app. That's where, yeah. why doesn't it show up? Yeah, if, if you're buying something that's not really from a foundry that is that has been kind of hacked together, and we're going to, we actually are working on bringing it to someone who designs typefaces on for a second hour um, to talk about some of the, the bits and be, bits and bobs of that. But if they don't do all the things they need to do when they build that font, so a lot of the cheaper fonts, if you buy something 300 fonts for $10 or something like that, they may not work super well in broadcast. Um, so you may you do want to kind of think through that a little bit. Uh, next question. Next question in from Joshua Feingold in New York. New York, I was invited to give a presentation and told there is an HDMI connection for my laptop. Does this mean I should bring a male HDMI cable, a female HDMI cable, or am I expected to have both? Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, what I always do is I carry a male-to-male -male, uh, HDMI cable and one of these, which is a turnaround, which is a female-to-female -female adapter. You stick it on the end of the cable, and if they have a male cable for you to connect to, you plug it into that and into your cable. And make sure you have a cable that adapts from whatever your computer is, because a lot of smaller computers these days have mini HDMI female out. So you need a mini HDMI male to large HDMI male, and you can put that female to female adapter on the end and plug it into anything. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, same exact answer. And uh, Bill? Well, the problem I've run into when I was doing a lot of presentations and people were bringing multiple computers in is generally not the HDMI thing. Once there's HDMI uh, input to the projector, I'm fine. It was getting the various models, and I've used Macs, but I think PC has the same thing. Which port on that needs to be adapted? And typically there's a dongle for each of those kinds of ports. So I used to carry about four or five dongles just to help people out who would bring in different PCs and different Mac generations because the video out signal that I was trying to get was often on an unusual port and I have to adapt those. So just a thought. Mitchell. Most of us carry a decimator with us wherever we go, because sometimes there's a, another issue that the projector is not going to like. I can tell you that it has saved me a number of times. I, I have to admit that I have generally, if I'm going to, I haven't shown up somewhere for a long time, as everybody knows, but uh, um, I, I decimator is definitely something that I have in my bag and it has saved me a couple times at events where the, the projector just couldn't for whatever reason tag into either my computer but most most usually a PC usually somebody had a PC and they couldn't get it to talk to the projector and if we just gave it a decimator we were able to fix that really quickly um, I do agree generally what they're telling you I think is going to be that they have an HDMI cable they're going to walk up to and, and want to plug it into something you know so standard HDMI cable and you just have to make sure that whatever you have you can hand back to them as H HDMI so you have to convert that USB-C you might have to convert whatever it's going to be but when they say they have a, an HDMI connected um, I would do all the precautions that were talked about before but I think what I would expect them to do is bring you any professional running a event would expect you to um, have you know just be able to accept an HDMI cable next question Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC, Canada. Um, I produce a podcast for a client that goes out to YouTube. They insist on wearing baseball caps, sometimes the guests too. So I've got a hard time getting light into their eyes. Should I try a large reflector on the floor, tilt it up? Good guy. Yeah, it depends on the scenario and what's appropriate. If it's a desk or um, if it's uh, another another surface that you could bounce off of, you might be able to put something like this uh Westcott down below or off angle where uh, the, these are meant to to fill in underneath the shadows of uh, the eyes of if the lights coming from up high. So if you, if you look at this uh, without eyeliner versus 
the silver, the white, and the sun. I mean, you can really see what's happening underneath. And you'll see in newscasts that they actually use uh, lights like uh, like these light mats. So something along these lines might be helpful because this is just a really flat light. I know it's hard to see in this this image, but basically it's just a it's a flat a flat light. And those are really cool. So those are two options to take a look at. Jason. Um, so I would reframe the shot so that it's high enough that, um, you could just throw one of these on the desk. Uh, another alternative, and they're not going to like it, is, um, put a loom cube right in their face and, um, that will light their face. All right, go ahead, Bill. The other thing that's real cheap, I used to carry a big piece of white linen with me, not terribly big. But to just lift their computers up and put that on the tabletop, and sometimes that gives you enough bounce fill from the Lecos or whatever is lighting the podium to give you facial fill under a ball cap. So that's a cheap solution. I go, Courtney. As the only person wearing a ball cap here today, I'll show you what I'm improvising. Uh, and it's a uh, little LED uh, <laughs> plugs into a USB port, has four bright LEDs. And I point that at something, uh, a piece of white uh, foam that's over here um, by my pencil holder and it sits in my pencil holder because uh, I've got it taped to a pencil. Now this is real, but if you, the problem is you don't want a point source of light from underneath like this, because then you look like Dracula. Uh, <laughs> so, so you want to make it uh, uh, softer and point it at something uh, that reflects, or like it was mentioned earlier, have a broader light that comes in from underneath to fill the shadows in under the hat it doesn't get rid of them completely, but it, it brightens it up enough to see their eyes. Here you go, Jesse. Also, double check that they're okay with having their eyes being seen on the video version because uh, you might find that sunglasses appear as soon as you've lit under their ball cap. Yeah, and one of the things that you want to look at is really soft. Some broadcasters also like, for a variety of reasons, like to have a little bit of uplight. Um, and one of the things that we've seen used over the last decade are, light, are Roscoe light pads. Um, that they are basically what they are is an LED that go around the outside edge and piece of glass that's just been um, uh, scratched, you know, <laughs> you know, across, and it and it just pr produces a very soft light, and it's really in a place where you don't need it. And I'll show you a picture of this in use. So this is in the wall at at, uh, uh, at the stock market. <laughs> so anyway, um, but the, you can see these little up lights on either side of those monitors, and so for each one of the guests, they have just that little soft up light that comes up. Um, that sits there um, right right below them, and it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty effective. Uh, next question, Courtney Gooden in Hollywood, California, asking: Was marveling at the Mid Journey Community Showcase. Has anyone created a TV screensaver that cycles through full screen images scraped from this site? And he has a uh, link to it. A good guy. I have not used uh, Mid Journey to do that, but I use a, another uh, platform that also uses Doll E and other uh, of the uh, AI constructions called, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it, uh, Night Cafe. And consequently, you can do a 10 to 20 second iteration of whatever you're creating, uh, but then it uses credits and consequently it, it requires a lot of, of my credits that uh, to make a 10 to 20 second video, but again, they're smaller. Mm -hmm. Again, the upscaling is the other other concept of how they're getting their 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 money or requiring you to you know, use your credits to get these additional features. Good, Courtney. Yeah, I was just thinking since this site is a community showcase and it's kind of uh, generated by AI, so it's a lot of fantastical pictures and they change constantly. It's updated, I don't know, every hour or so. Wouldn't it be a great screensaver to put these individual images up on your TV or something when you're not watching TV, just as kind of an art generator for the room. And it would have all this uh, copyright free uh, imagery to work from. Oh, I love that. Uh... <laughs> Angry turnip over there. <laughs> angry turnip. It would be great to have an angry turnip. I do think that there's going to be a, uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunities here to, to, to do generation. I'll be honest, you can generate so many images so fast, I'd be tempted to just do my own <laughs> because I can, you know, sit in mid journey and, and, uh, and, and produce, you know, sometimes I can sit down and produce in a couple hours. Um, usually on the weekend, I, I kind of go, sometimes go into a bit of a, push on it and I'll make two or 300 images, you know, and so, and there are, a lot of them are similar, but a lot of them are the same. Could you, could uh, you have chat different. GPT generate the text prompts and feed that into mid journey? 
You can. You, you, I've, I've actually had it do that. I, I said, describe this, and it'll just dis- build a larger description. And then I'll, and then I just put, you know, I, and I tell it to just start with imagine, <laughs> slash imagine, so I can just cut and paste it in. Um, and and ChatGPT will do it. I haven't found that I got better results, you know, from ChatGPT doing those descriptions. Um, but uh, but I have built really long descriptions. I, I I I a lot of times what happens is I because. Because Midjourney is um, on my phone because of Discord, a lot of times I'll start ideas on my phone. Like I'll see something, I go, I'll just think something's funny. Um, I think we talked about it the other day. I, I was I, for some reason I saw some picture, of some meme or something, and I just I just imagined people hunting dinosaurs, and so I was like, you know, man running from Tyrannosaurus Rex with with a rifle, and so I got that, you know, like and I just, but I like made it while I was you know at the airport, you know, just you know and. And, um, and so the thing is, is that I, uh, uh, I think that I would highly encourage it. I, I've, I've been talking to somebody about their, their bar and saying, you should just put kiosks on all the bar on uh, at the bar and just put screens along the side and let people generate them, you know? So that's what you, cause I got to tell you the, the best thing to do with uh, mid journey is to sit around drinking beer or, or coffee, you know, and, 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 uh, and uh, making coming up with ideas that uh, and and people just kind of throwing them in and seeing what the next thing is and and then being able to submit them you know to be put up on the wall and someone curates them and that type of thing I think it'd be a lot of fun to to have a coffee shop or a or a bar that did that or a hookah but, lounge yeah especially hookah lounge <laughs> yeah exactly a hookah lounge would be great uh, go ahead Sky well I just tested the uh, sloth on the cover of Vogue magazine and. I got a similar image to what had been shown in your your community showing, but I then tried Time and Life magazine with a sloth, of Mm -hmm. course, and it did not come out as as cleanly as what we would expect a Time or Life magazine. So somewhere at some point, somebody's trained. You can throw things in. Yeah, but you you can throw things into it like uh, ultra ultra detailed 8K, even though it doesn't do 8K. Yeah, don't disagree, but... I can hardly ever get good text and consistently it it's, it doesn't know how to do text, but Vogue is, that's why I'm trying to figure out why Vogue uh, is working well. Yeah. Probably because it, it, it probably views it. that as an image, you know, but if it, if it's probably uh, less texty and it it views it as an image. Um, but, but yeah, it doesn't do text well and it doesn't do fingers very well. <laughs> so, so Unless you do the limitations fingers. with only five yeah. fingers. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, next question. Brett Below in Appleton, Wisconsin, asking, does the panel have any advice, recommendations, or horror stories on insuring camera gear from theft or damage? Good, Jesse. Uh, You're asking the wrong questions, Detective. You want to look into voluntary parting and how how nuclear that is. Uh, Voluntary parting is the idea that if you hand over your gear voluntarily for a rental or lending it to a friend, it's not a criminal matter. It's not theft. You voluntarily parted, so it's a civil matter, and you can't make a, a theft claim either through your insurance or through the police. Go ahead, Mitchell. Don't mess with insurance. It's a thing that you just have to have regardless. Even if the person you're renting, if you're renting a gear to somebody has it and they say they'll they'll cover it, you must have insurance. I had a a client, uh, a big client, uh, damage a camera one time uh, and they blamed us saying it was our fault because the tripod didn't work properly. And uh, my insurance company paid the uh, uh, the claim off, then went ahead and sued the uh, my big corporate client and I lost that client. Good. Courtney? Yeah, as insurance could be a whole second hour topic because you have to make sure. Don't think uh, if you have homeowner's insurance that covers your your personal stuff that it's going to cover it because if you're using it in business, most of them have disclaimers that say, now it's used in business, it's not covered. So don't expect your insurance to cover it necessarily. And uh, they have written so many exclusions into uh Insurance packages these days, if it's stolen from a car, usually it isn't covered or it's got a, you know, a huge deductible. So read all the fine print of that insurance policy before you loan stuff out. Yeah, you want your insurance policy to be written by someone who writes it for equipment, <laughs> so not for, you know, not for something else. Um, you know, so you, you don't cover it in some general, uh, don't expect to be general insurance. Uh, the other thing is, is that you, you do want to look, Courtney pointed out, something we just saw, I, all the rental companies. All the rental companies seem to talk to each other. So you don't see anything and then suddenly you see a whole bunch of things. One of the things that's popped up that is new is this requirement that they have that you cover um, gear stolen out of even a locked car. So stolen out of a car, what Courtney brought up, is now two years ago, we never heard, or before COVID, we had never heard that stipulation. Like we just had it 
you know, there, but now if you don't cover that, they won't rent you the gear. So that becomes a, um, and it's not in a lot of insurance, you know, it, 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 it's not stipulated specifically in a lot of insurance. And so, so those are the things, those are little things that rental companies are going to look for too. Because a rental company, if you rent from a company, not borrow lenses or something, they, they charge you assume, you know, with, and you can put insurance on it, you know, there. Um, but if you're, if you have real equipment, um, you're going to, uh, like uh, that you're renting a lot of, um, then you're going to need to make sure that you have your own insurance and it's going to need to be, uh, it's, it's not that expensive to, you know, have a lot of insurance if you're doing business. Um, if you're not doing business, if you're not, if you're doing this every once in a while, it's expensive, but I, I don't know. I mean, I think we probably at, at my height for pixel core, I think we had, uh, $2 million of loss, $7 million of, of, uh, liability. Um, you know, a bunch of other, um, uh, other other insurances that were there, and they cost. I mean, they did cost ten or twenty thousand dollars a year you know, to to do that, but that was a lot, and that's enough insurance that you can go into a large venue because they're going. Everybody requires you to show insurance when you show up, and so you had to have. We had to have enough that we could show up at a large venue and still be within their whatever their their requirements were. So probably someone should write this down. But insurance is probably a good one. We'll bring somebody on a a, a cop, you know, a um, underwriter. See if we can't uh, um, get someone to talk about it. It'd be really good. Um, next question. Andy Shaw in London asking, Hi, my eyes are taking a hit from all the screen time. Would larger screens further away be better than a 24-inch screens that are a table let depth away? Any other thoughts about reducing eye strain? Thank Go you. Jesse. Uh, one of the things I like to do is keep my monitors on a swivel head so that I can move it closer and further away. Having that uh, difference in distance across the course of a day will really reduce your eye strain. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Farther the way, the better. I've got two 24 inches right in front of me and a window behind them. And often one of the best things you can do is just to look up, stretch your eyes by looking at a farther uh, distance uh, object. And that gives them a little bit of exercise so they don't freeze up on you. I go, Jason. Pretty much what Mitch said. Um, yeah, a bigger screen will help you to a certain point, but really, what you need to do is is be able to engage different focal lengths. Even if it you you know just set a timer um, once an hour, look away for two minutes or so, and I think you won't have an issue. Go oh, it's kind. I've also observed that Guy Cochran has also using a, a specific lens, and that's uh, specific for the 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 blue effect, I, I believe. But I'll let Guy if he wants to talk about it. Good, go yeah, ahead. These gamer, okay, good, sorry, go ahead, these gamer glasses are helpful for reducing some of the brightness. That's why I put them on. It's, sometimes it's hard for me to, to look at these uh, small print um, items for extended periods of time. So these glasses help. Um, I'd recommend getting some of them if you're, if you're finding that the, the light is, the brightness is actually a factor in, in what you're looking at. You good, Courtney? Yeah, everything that was said about your eyeballs focusing further away and closer. But another thing to consider is your posture. If you're working on a laptop and you're hunched over a laptop, looking at your laptop, looking down all day, that can really create spinal issues in your neck. So if you have a monitor across the room raised up so that you have to look up to it, uh, that will uh, help improve your posture and create less spinal problems in the future. Yeah, I, I used to resist uh, having a bright area around it. But, you know, in the last couple of years, I got used to having these lights and having a white area and it really reduced the amount of strain. It's the really bright monitor in front of a dark area that you, I will do when I need to for color or for other things, but I try to avoid it. Otherwise, um, you, I get up a lot. <laughs> so I, I just walk away um, from things a lot. So, so it's a little easier on, on, on my eyes to do that. The other thing to remember is that your phone may be causing as much or more of the trouble than your um, than your monitors. And I my my phone is turned to nighttime. You know, the real warm. It's turned all the way up, and it's at about half half of its brightness by default. And then if I'm going to watch a movie or I'm going to do something, I'll turn it all up. But I I literally that made more difference for me than anything I've done with any monitor ever was turning my phone to a point where it, it was a warm light. And, and relatively dark. If you look at my phone, it'll look very odd <laughs> when you're looking at it. Um, but it, 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 it definitely made, I felt like I was getting like building up a hole in the middle of my, my, my vision with the, with the phone. So think about that as well. Next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael asking, would a lines isolator like the Walrus Audio Canvas be better to use on unbalanced synths in the studio than a direct box? I go ahead, Jason. No. 
if you have a direct box and it's doing what it should do, then no, it shouldn't be any different. Oh, sorry, yeah, Mitchell. Yeah, the, the trick is to isolate the uh, sources from each other. And the best way to do that is with a transformer. So as long as the direct box or even this uh, Canvas audio device has a uh, transformer in it, it's going to provide isolation. And it does, the uh, Wave Audio Canvas does have a transformer in the output. If you have a choice of transformers, Jensen's the ticket. Next question. Next question from Paul Perkowski in Gainesville, Florida. Why and how should someone use the reference SDI input on DeckLink and other Blackmagic design devices? Yeah, so that's going to sync all sync them all up with reference a reference input. So you're going to be able to if you put the reference into absolutely everything, you will reduce the latency in the system. So the the, the thing is is that with other with with old broadcast um, equipment, you had to do it. Like if you put an EVS without reference, it'll just sit there and things will, you know, not not line up or or a lot of other things. But a lot of the black magic stuff is pretty forgiving. It just reclocks everything as it comes through. Um, but that reclocking takes um, it takes about, up to a frame for it to get everything synced back up again. So uh, you can reduce all of that if you if you do that, and it allows you to integrate with the other. Uh, the other devices that may not be black magic um, that that need to have those things uh, managed and that's another we have it on the list of things for friday is to talk about reference for, for a second hour because we think it's definitely something that people need to know more about next question john filer in greenfield massachusetts john asked windows 8.1 will reach end of support as of today how dangerous is it to continue using any previous versions of windows uh, go ahead courtney and eh, not that dangerous, you know. Uh, I wouldn't go browsing to a lot of unknown websites with it. Uh, I'd be very careful about putting it on the internet. Uh, eight, not so much, you know, it's still covered under most uh, antivirus stuff. So I wouldn't worry too much about eight. There's a lot of people still out there using XP, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, and it still works, you know. I've still got programs that I wrote for Windows 98 that run great in Windows 11. So, you know. You don't have to worry about obsolescence that much. Just worry about the uh, bad guys, the viruses, the things like that. So just be careful in your browsing. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, what Courtney just said, uh, security patches primarily. Um, then to a second degree, some drivers may not uh, uh, play nice. If they're new drivers, you have to update. Um, the Windows may not accept it because it's an old version. Next question. Ian Alford from London, England. We've got three Count them three cameras at our church, two Blackmagic, one Panasonic, going into an ATEM for our live stream. How can I balance the cameras so they match and also make them look amazing? Do I need scope box? And then what should I do? Go ahead, Jesse. Um, the matching is going to happen at the camera level, and the look amazing is going to happen at uh, just past the ATEM level. So what you're going to want to do is build a lot. I don't know what Panasonic you have, but you can build a lookup table for your Blackmagic cameras that will help them to look exactly like the Panasonic. And you feed them all into the ATEM looking alike. Uh, when you get from the ATEM to your computer, open up OBS, and you'll be able to apply another LUT to all three of those feeds to make them look exactly how you want. And Alex, you've spoken on matching multiple cameras using uh, a difference blending to build your LUT. Uh, uh, perhaps a second hour? Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead, Sky. Uh, I feel your pain. And again, that's why in major sports, you will have a color shader that's constantly following. Now, obviously, you don't have cloud issues that are changing your, your lighting issues in a house of worship. But again, different horses are different sizes for different jobs. And sometimes you're putting different mm -hmm. sizes of cameras next to each other. We have a PTZ that will not match our Panasonic's. So I've had to, again, try to set up something as uh, in where your humans are going to be seen and do a color palette and do some lines, some angles, and then run a whole uh, sample through your YouTube and into a, an mm -hmm. iPhone or something that somebody's mm -hmm. going to be watching and test it that way. Yep. Uh, uh, Bill? For me, when I've had mismatched cameras, so in this case, two Blackmagic and one Panasonic, getting that mismatched camera to match the others usually takes about five to 10 times more time than if I had just gone with the three uh, similar brands. Color science is just different in cameras. Can it be done? Yes. But is it hard and time consuming? I have found yes. 
Yeah, the, the, the hardest part is getting the ca any camera that doesn't, you know, you have a lot more control over the Blackmagic camera, so you're going to tend to want to make the, the Panasonic look at, at look as good as it possibly can. So that's the one that you focus on, of making sure that that one's going to look great um, for what you what you want. Then you're going to end up matching the Blackmagic cameras to that. Now that can be done, and there's a variety of different ways of doing that. Um, the way we do it from a, with a live switcher only is we have a color chart. I don't know if I have one. I don't I don't have my largest one here, but you have a color chart. <coughs> Dumont chart is usually what we use. And, and, and the reason I use it is because it has um, it has a rectangle that will, um, that if we do a transition from, from the inside camera to the outside, we can split this rectangle of color. Um, you can also just build, <laughs> one of our former panelists uh, um, uh, just realized you could just put a, a bunch of colors across the center of a of a screen and 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 just just do a wipe. But the idea is you want to see one camera on one side and one camera on the other. So once you get the camera to where you want it, you take these colors and they just want to represent all the colors that you would need to match, and um, you split it. And then you take the camera that you can shade um, from the you know one of the Black Magic cameras. And you start moving their color around until until those until you can't see the line between them and now you know that you have and usually what we do is we capture the the first screen and then we load load the camera and then play it against it that way you're not a you're not anyway you don't need to um you can put the camera in exactly the same position so now so now you when you don't see that split you can just go through camera after camera after camera it does take time to do this um I, you know usually we allocate, um, you know, to, to do it well um, and and to do it in an artsy way. So you can't, because you're doing it in an artsy way because you're matching a camera, you're not matching scopes. Uh, the way we do it in scopes to make them perfectly accurate is use a, you, you would use a vector scope and those Dumont charts um, will, uh, the, the colors that they put in will actually draw a line in the vector scope, you know, b between all the points. So you can make your cameras perfectly accurate with that Dumont chart. But if you don't have a Dumont chart, you can have other color charts. You just have to match them together. Um, the other thing that you can do is put LUTs on the cameras, as, as Jesse talked about. And then you can also add a box. And there's a variety of different boxes that'll do it. And some monitors, some little monitors will do it. Apply a LUT to the Panasonic as well. <laughs> so then what you do is you just, you apply the LUT to all the cameras to match them. But first you get one camera just the way you want it. Then you apply that LUT and you use LUTs to match those. And we are going to talk about this later this year uh, as far as how to do it. The reason we're not talking about it is because I have a way that I do it that is not consistent. It works for me and it doesn't, it hasn't worked consistently for other people. <laughs> so I have to figure out how to make it more um, user-friendly. Uh, so uh, so I think I have, I know why I didn't, but I have to, I have to do a little bit more testing before we're ready to, ready to show you it. Cause I don't want to send you off on a, on a trail that's painful. Um, next question. Paul Prusikowski in Gainesville, Florida. For those who use DaVinci Resolve regularly, what is your preferred monitor setup? If multi-monitor, what tools do you display as default on each screen? You know, it's funny. I, I do most of my Resolve work on one monitor. I, if, and for whatever reason, I don't split things up a lot. I just jump between the pages. Um, and that, and I think it's because I, I, I did so much work on my iMac on, on Resolve that I now have more monitors. I just don't, I don't put things over there. Go ahead, uh, Bill. Well, I just wanted, and I don't use Resolve itself. I use uh, Final Cut. But uh, for me, there's a process in Final Cut called Workspaces, and I don't use a single one. For example, the last three days uh, of my work, I've had a client who came in Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and we are going through a new client's uh, history of hard drives for them. So we are going through hundreds and hundreds of files and everybody on the team's trying to get to know them. So I wanted exactly what was on my laptop in terms of the names and everything else to be reflected on my big monitors. So I'm changing my entire monitor array to get that task done. And at the end of that, I will switch back to one of my default workspaces so that I can get back to regular editing. I think, you know, Everybody has a default that they like the most, but I look for flexibility in terms of being able to match the display architecture to the task at hand. I find that much more valuable than concentrating on what's my default. Yeah, I, I, I will say that I was juggling and I, and I haven't set the monitors up in a certain way because again, I was used to single, but I, I was just doing some stuff in Fusion and I was like, this would be much better if I was, if I could have, a, I had this little screen of what I was working on and I was doing these, I was moving the, I was adjusting the nodes and I was like, I don't, I don't know why I'm doing it that way. So, so I, I am. It's definitely something. If you ask that question in a couple of weeks, I'll probably have a, a more specific answer because I realized that I had hit some wall in 
in Resolve, um, both with, I was doing something else in Fairlight as well. And in both cases, I was like, I need to figure out these monitors because it's not, it doesn't make any sense anymore to, to have it all in, in one. So it's a good, it's a good point. Let's, we'll keep talking about that. Next question. John Feiler from Greenfield, Massachusetts. John asked, Google has been deleting files from users' drives they deem inappropriate. The latest example being uploads of Kanye West saying something uh, bad. All politics aside, how does the panel feel about this? All right, go ahead, Jesse. I think we put a lot of time and energy into maintaining. I'm, I'm going to take this not just on Google Drive, but we're going to open this up a little bit. We, we put a lot of time and energy into maintaining our YouTube feeds, our Instagram feeds, TikTok, whatever it is. And this gives us a sense that we have um, equity in the company. We, we do not. We are guests in their house. Um, it, it, when, once you upload, it's not your data. It's their data. And they are allowed to curate it how they want to. I feel like we get headlines and this conversation comes up every six to 12 months because some platform makes some adjustment that people who feel like they have equity in the business because of the amount of time they contribute to the business um, that, that upsets them. Uh, well, but we that, always, always I think, I need that, reminders. That, that, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I think that the, the challenge here is, this, I think he's talking about people getting stuff deleted from their drives that they're paying for, their Google drives that they're actually paying for, which is slightly different. Um, yeah, uh, but slightly yeah. different, but we're still Not guests really. in their house and it yeah. is their data once it's on their drives. Yeah. yeah. And they're accountable for it is the issue. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah. Who gets to decide what's inappropriate? You know, I'm not trying to defend what happened, but I'm saying I'm concerned that somebody else is making that decision. It's not right. I, I, yeah, it's a business decision on their part. So I, I, I you know, as go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, there are certain things that are illegal <clears throat> in many states, child pornography being one to possess uh, and distribute. So uh, they want to protect uh, other people from, you know, if, if anyone is hosting something that is deemed illegal, uh, I assume they have the right to remove it from their servers. Uh, if it's in your personal, you know, if it's non-public, if it's in a non-public folder, I don't think they really have the right to censorship unless there is something that is strictly illegal to possess. You know, I, I don't have any problem with it as long as they tell us that they're going to do it. Like, you know, if they suddenly started doing it when they didn't do it before, I think that, you know, they have to protect their own their own position, you know, and, and they don't want to be seen as a place that you can hold in, inappropriate things on their on their system from a brand perspective. Um, you know, I, I my one of my favorite quotes uh, <laughs> from a movie is, from Unforgiven, where he just says, deserves got nothing to do with it. <laughs> I don't view things as we deserve to have anything. Um, I think that they have a business and we have a we have our, our data. And if you want your data to be more protected, don't put it in Google Drive, you know, like, you know, and, and so, um, you know, they're making they're creating a service that service has a has a series of limitations. And as long as they tell us what the, I, I think that to, to Mitchell's point, I just think they need to tell us that 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 they that they reserve the right, and it needs to be pretty clear that they reserve the right to take stuff out that they don't think is appropriate. Um, the other thing I will say is that I would never put anything, even if I was doing a documentary, I would never put anything that I viewed um, as that could be interpreted as inappropriate onto a drive on the internet. That is, I think the technical term for it is. Kuka Luka. <laughs> like, you know, like you should never, 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 but never, never put anything up that you think could be remotely questionable on the internet. You know, like you are, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's your drive or, or it's some kind of locked in, it's you're putting yourself in a horrible position. And even if you have a reason for it and you're collecting these for evidence or you're doing whatever, not a good idea. <laughs> Next question. Rodrigo Munez from Stockholm, Sweden, asking, apart from bulletin, ND built-in, sorry, ND filters, what is the difference between BMP CC 6K Pro and Blackmagic Ursa Broadcast G2? Now that they have the same sensor, um, neutral density, uh, none, no stops, uh, image quality? Good guy. Yeah, with the sensors being the same, it really comes down to creature comforts and how you're used to shooting. I, I used to operate a full-size broadcast camera, so I'm familiar where I can just grab my ND when I it's spin a little wheel. So when when you're looking at the the item in the camera itself, uh, over here, there's some familiar controls uh, for shutter. Uh, the other thing is the cabling to power a servo-type lens. So on the Blackmagic Pocket line, you won't have that, and you'll have to power from uh, an external battery. 
uh, there's some additional communication that happens in there. You also have the shoulder mount capability. And then if you're out in bright sunlight, having a, a uh, viewfinder that you can look through, also having the shotgun mic built in and, and being able to uh, capture audio that's, um, you know, you're not worried as much about knocking that that mic off as you are in some of the handheld form factor cameras. And then you've got the the larger V-mount batteries. It's it's just a more pro setup. And then you can go to PL mount uh, lenses very easy. The the one that I like to pair is this one here. And for Mad in the Kitchen, I did put on my Blackmagic Pocket 6K. I put this monster lens, and it was it was it was a lot to put on that. Uh, even with the Duclos EF to uh, PL adapter, it was a lot of weight to put on that on that. Uh, and then the other thing that you've got is SDI. Uh, in and out so you can flip a switch and, and look at program which is nice if you're if you want to frame up a shot you can just push it with one button then you got built-in xlrs uh there's just there it's just different different strokes for different folks i mean it, it is a, a a lot more money to get this camera but it, it just depends on and, oh yeah, and here right here is the lens control pin i know that uh, alex is familiar with that because one time he called me looking for that cable so <laughs> yeah. it's one of those things that you may need one Cable's day it's really hard to find yeah exactly yeah they are hard to find and uh i think that's about everything yeah, and, and all, all the stuff the guy said. I, I believe you can change those. Um, I, I have the 12Ks, and so I'm not sure that with the broadcast cameras guy, you can change the uh, the mount from PL from PL to EF to to B4, right? I mean, that's those are all. It's a little bit of a you have to tear. You 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 basically can take one mount out and put the other mount in. So I yeah. believe you can do that with the broadcast one. So that's really nice, especially with broadcast. If you want to you know, use a traditional B4 mount. Um, you can you can do that, or the EF is easy, and then of course the um, PL, and I guess they have an F mount as well for it. So, um, so those are a lot of different mounting options, um, and th those are the things that we. And a lot of times for the Ursas, we're putting on big big lenses um, that need that lens control that you would have there that you wouldn't have with the uh, with the thing. So it's it's a it's a much different camera. Um, you can what's interesting about them is because they have the same color uh, science and the same chips. We've definitely done things where we've cut between Ursas and um, and the uh, Black Magic, so you can on some of the smaller shots or something we have, we might have a Black Magic, and you can shade all those cameras from your, you know, if you, if you use the bi directionals, you can have a constellation. You can be sitting there shading all the cameras as needed um, to uh, to make that happen. And and what, yeah, so those it's a lot a lot of advantages. Go ahead, Sky. I bought mine specifically for uh, the ability to have flexibility. So to guys comment about ergonomics i had to buy a small rig and a cage and then do all the ancillary things that often come with an eng camera automatically and so that's where the plus the price point it was it was less expensive at the time and the but the visual quality and but i still had to spend more money to make it an ergonomic go out of the field kind of a camera yep yeah. uh, next question from Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromsø, Norway, GLINet recently released their new Barrel AX router with failover and load sharing between Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Tether. What is the favorite pro router for fly packs or mobile production? For a lot of the ones that we build, um, we use the uh, the Meraki Z3s, um, and they have they specifically let you put a modem into them. So, so that I think Z3C. Um, and so if we need more bandwidth, we'll use a larger one, but a, a basic fly pack that goes out for us goes into that because it's just, as soon as it's connected, it's part of the system. In fact, we can see it once it's been connected, even if it's not, you know, as soon as it sees the internet, I can see that. And then what we do is we can um, put all of the IPs. So we, we leave all of our equipment on DHCP and we let the router uh, define that, but we define the, the IPs of the equipment from the, um, uh, from their MAC address. So we say this MAC address is going to be this IP. And so we were able to um, make, you know, that router just takes over whatever you put in there and gives it the IP that it needs. It's a lot of registry and setup to make that work. But um, but once you have that working, uh, you can have that, it'll work anywhere. And um, uh, and it's, it's just a lot easier for us to handle. When we were doing this with Pixelcore, it was easier to handle a fleet because we had, I think, eight eight fly kits that were going, eight major fly kits and some minor ones that were floating around. And so we needed to be able to see them um, going going out there. So that's what we use for for those. For streaming decks, we use the larger versions of the Meraki. Um, I think that Ubiquity is also a great solution for less money. <laughs> you know, so the Dream Machine, the a lot of the Ubiquity stuff is is, is more cost effective. And Guy, I, I it's Linksys that makes the, um, who make, or Netgear, 
that makes the AV AV um, routers. Yeah, Netgear AV line, uh, mm. specifically the M4250 AV line. Uh, that's what I'm flowing my uh, NDI through, and it has uh, specific wizards to to specifically say Dante NDI. Um, there's a couple other in there that are um, easy to set up. Just you answer the questions, and it sets up your your whole router for you. Another one that we we've used a lot of are the pep waves, um, and and the and the reason for that is they have a lot of options where you have you can put a bunch of cells in there, and you can have a bunch of different Ethernet and Wi-Fi, and you can split up what all that, you know, you really have a lot of control over how that actually works, and they're really designed to work in the field. So, uh, and oftentimes we had those combined. So for our larger kits, we'd have a you know larger you know Meraki four hundred that would be in the in a main kit, and then you'd have this this uh, router that was handling you know all the different ways that we might have internet. Um, next question. From Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, does the OBSBOT, OBSBOT Tiny 4K AI-powered PTZ 4K webcam stack up to the Insta360 Link webcam? A good guy. Yeah, I was looking at these at CS, and they actually had them up on a big screen, and it was surprising how good it looked. Uh, and we weren't even well lit. They weren't trying to make it look really good. Uh, we just happened to walk by the booth. Take I went to look at the, uh, the additional... Um, uh, adapter that they have, which I believe you have, right, As a, Alex, be a, a USB to yep. HDMI adapter. So they had that driving directly into a display. So that's how they had their setup for the booth. Um, the chip size is smaller than the Insta360. Insta if you look at their website, it says equipped with a one over 2.8 inch image sensor, which is smaller than the one that we'll we'll see with the Insta360. So I'd say I'd still buy an Insta360 over um, over an Ozbot, but they're they're intriguing for sure at the at the price point. Uh, the gesture control is the same, so you're not getting anything there. Not that a bunch of us need to use the gesture control, but uh, auto tracking and gesture control, I believe, are the same exact manufacturer uh, or chip that's inside. From what the gentleman was saying at the booth, is that's off the shelf stuff. That's not. That's not uh, directly from uh, them. Like they don't make mm -hmm. it. Ne neither company makes it. I think it's DJI that actually makes that. Right. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I. You know, I have both of them. Uh, I bought them because you know you're a bad friend and you make me buy stuff. Uh, <laughs> I. I think they're both kind of cute. They're interesting. I, I. I'm not saying they're horrible. I mean, th this is the ob spot. There's my window with the the view of the bay. Uh, um. It's okay. Uh, the I I will say this that the Obsbot is built tougher. It, it it's it's a better build. It's not quite so dainty and fiddly as the uh, Insta. But I mean, let's face it. We should have what do you call it, Alex? Soft hands. You know when yeah. you're dealing with gear. So you should be careful with it. But if you're if you're not careful with stuff, you might want the Obsbot. I I will say, and we'll see how it all turns out. That I you know I how use many have you broken? I have Cut not to the chase. How many? Any, any. I've dropped. I've dropped one of them. I don't. I'm, I dropped it like three times on last Friday. Just as I was putting it on something, taking it off something, and I, and I drop it. I'm like, Ooh. I say something that's not good for a clean show, and then I pick it up and put it back up, and it worked just fine. So it was, they're a little bit more robust than I expected them to be. Um, but they. Um, and I just got. I don't know if we. Uh, I don't know. I got cases. They make. There's a company now that makes cases. Um, you know, I found I found cases for them. So I got little soft cases that I can put them all in. All I bought one to make sure it worked, and then I've got three more coming today. Um, but the um, uh, I, I think that the color and the sharpness and the controls on the Insta 360 are head and shoulder over the Obspot. You know, like I don't think that it's. I, I think the Obspot looks fine. Um, but I did borrow one um, for, you know, a day and compared the two of them and was, you know, it, it, again, I, I, if I hadn't seen the Insta360, I think the Obspot looked great. <laughs> you know, like it was like, oh, this looks good. Um, comparing them head to head and maybe I'll get another one in and we can take a, we can um, put them up against a chart, put them up against some images, put them up against, you know, and just cut back and forth. But the amount of control you have in the Insta360 software, I thought was much better as well. So that, that's another consideration. Um, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. And they're not as fragile as you may think, because remember these these gimbals are made by uh, DJI and they're designed to fly around on drones and crash into things and crash into the ground and fall out of the sky and they seem to survive. So yeah. I, they're not that uh, fragile. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Maybe for the record, Courtney, I've broken plenty of drones. Um, and and yes, the 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 gimbal does die. 
Uh, so, Alex, what is the update on your your mini your mini multicam OBS body studio? What's going on? I'm, I, you know, I've got most of it working in in my Mac Studio. I'm trying to figure out whether I can make it work inside of a mini, a, a Mac Mini, as opposed to the Mac Studio, because it'd be a much less expensive ex- execution. So, so I'm trying to like figure out whether the problem with the Mac Studio with the Mac Mini is there's not enough ports. It's not the power. It has plenty of power to do it. And I've been, you know, I think I'm going to end up getting a couple um, of the OWC uh, breakouts so that I can make that work. I I just haven't ordered them yet. I'm, it's mostly that OWC has so many options that I get lost. I go up there and I go, uh, I don't, you know, like this one or this one. And the last one I bought was the wrong one. Like I, I bought one from OWC that was like had the wrong connector on it and it was not what I needed. And so I'm a little like I just I haven't had time the brain the brain space to to go in there and like figure out look look because I I've learned with OWC I have to look at every single port and then read all the documentation to make sure I'm grabbing the right one because there's just there's too many options and so uh, anyway so that's the yeah hold off on that Alex I, I may or may not have um, a bit of a direct line for you <laughs> okay okay very good all right next question. From Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico, ChatGPT is planning on monetization strategies. Has anyone filled the poll? Go ahead, John. So, so what's happening now? And the APIs, uh, especially for OpenAI, is is published, right? So, for Ada all the way up to DaVinci, um, and it's a token-based system. But, but my belief is you're going to see this stuff get integrated into the bigger apps. And so it's going to be integrated into Word. Uh, Adobe is going to integrate stuff directly into Photoshop and Illustrator. And so I believe this technology is going to get integrated into the apps that we use on a daily basis. Skype, uh, Sky, real quick. I talked to a friend of mine who's in media and marketing, and he uses chat GBT every day. So, yes, I also filled in the the survey because the the landscape is happening. They used to have to mail postcards that you'd have to send back or make a phone call. But to get their communication to their uh, customers instantaneously like like this, uh, yeah, I want to be a part of the change. Uh, Next question. From Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, why is it so hard to find Zoom and other virtual events? I know they're out there. Is there no dedicated directory or search engine focused just on virtual events? Google, Google it equals not acceptable answer. Go, Jesse. A lot of the events that we produced were meant to exist only on that day at that time. They were meant to be public, but they were not meant to be archived on the Internet. A lot of the events that we made to be archived that were supposed to be public uh, forever, uh, the the clients found that they had the, the feel of 2020 on them and kind of wanted to distance themselves from that feeling. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Bill. Just remember, this is a big data challenge. Uh, I looked it up really quickly, asked Siri, and there's between 1.14 and 1.7 billion websites mm-hmm. registered now. So mm-hmm. finding any of them, getting to any of them is an amazing challenge without some form of heuristics where you're putting in rules and, and filtering. There's just no hope you're going to ever find a particular thing. So your skill at building those heuristics, say I want websites that only meet these categories, you just have to have that. There's just yep. too many out there. Yeah, the the um uh the problem really is is that they just think of them as events, you know, and, and you don't there's not a, a there's not a great place to find events in general. You're looking for something very specific. You might do events on video. Almost all events within the next year will be have some online version, um and uh, and so you just want to keep looking for those. I mean, if you find an event you like, you just got to figure out how are they going to deliver a VOD? Are they going to deliver it live? Are they going to deliver it digital? You know, those are the things you want to look for. Next question. Next one is Morgan Price from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. When and why would you move to SDI for an insert home office studio for things like Zoom and remote presenting? Before next purchases, I'm debating if there are advantages to make the move or not. I have some black magic here already. Go ahead, Courtney. At in-home use, you could stay with HDMI. The only reason to go to SDI might be if, you're, if your switcher or router only has SDI inputs, then you might convert everything over to SDI. But if you've got uh, a switcher, router, and cameras that have, all have HDMI, and you're not going to be setting up cameras that are feeding from further away than 10 or 15 feet, you should be fine staying in HDMI. SDI, if you're going to run any long cable runs. But converting between the two can cause, you know, is going to cause latency uh, between whatever you have to convert. So you have to deal with that. 
I am moving <laughs> to SDI. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm in the process of getting all the equipment together and there'll be some big weekend where I change over. And it mostly has to do with routing. I need to route a bunch of stuff. I'm t- you know, the Blackbird 8x8 is fine, but I need a 20x20 20 20 router. You know, like, and I just need to be able to move things around and I want to use Zoom ISO to be able to grab a whole bunch of things. So I'm going to have eight outputs from, my, from what I'm jo- joining in Zoom ISO so that I can plug that into my routing. And now I can fill screens with different windows that are here along with other data. And then I can also, you know, go to a, a regular switcher. And I just, it took me a little while to kind of get my head around it, but I am, um, um, I'm probably, I'm, within the next month, I'll be on all SDI because of that. And it's mostly just comes down to being able to route more signals into more places in the HDMI format is just really painful. Uh, next question. From Rodrigo Munez from Stockholm, Sweden. Having completed Audinate's Dante certification level one, how often do people actually ask for these certifications before a job as a freelancer? Almost never. <laughs> it's just like, like no one knows. You should take them. They're really good classes. And then you understand. We, we usually expect people to, if we're going to hire someone that's going to manage that, we expect them to know that stuff. I don't, I mean, if you're working for an installation or you're getting a job, you might want to have those certifications. I've never seen any, but I've never asked for, a, a, you know, a, a Dante certification. I've never seen anybody ask for one. So um, the, uh, but they're, if you're going to say that you can do Dante, you should get, you should go through the certification class because they're actually really good. So um, I would highly recommend it. Next question. Jesse Mills, San Francisco Bay Area. How would the Insta360 do if the subject was about 25 feet away? Is this webcam controllable via companion? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Bill, real quick. Yeah, how much light is on them? Uh, what are they wearing? There's all sorts of variables to this. So a, a particular camera, I don't think you can make this just a subject that far. It doesn't work. It, you, you, it's the, the, the outer the outer end, about four feet. <laughs> four feet is when they're really good. As soon as you go longer than that, you're going to start trying to use digital zoom. You're going to be doing a bunch of other things. It just, it, it's really designed as a personal webcam. You're not going to cover an event with it um, unless you need a wide shot because it's going to be a really wide shot. And so uh, I, I, it, it, it is, um, and there's no way to control them. We are going to make requests about <laughs> having them give us API control or something else. But right now, the only way we know of, and I think we've actually reached out to them, is to control it through the software that they give you um, to run those. And so hopefully they'll give us more control over time. Um, uh, yeah, you were going to say something, David, or no? No. I'm so uh, sorry. Old habits die hard. I pressed <laughs> the button by accident. Um, they do have hotkeys now. Um, for switching between the presets. So um, you can assign hotkeys to Stream Deck buttons. Um, yeah. Oh, to, to, to change the controls? To, to do lots of things. You can okay. to, to pan, tilt, zoom, hit, mm-hmm. hit presets, all that other good stuff. Great. It'd be great if they just gave us controls. <laughs> for those, like an API would be great, given that they give APIs for all their other cameras. Uh, next question. Henry Ramos from Yonkers, New York. How do you determine the proper height to use in a standing desk? Uh, go ahead, Jason, real quick. For me, this is twofold. Uh, set the desk where you want your hands to be and then use an Ergotron lift to um, basically put it, uh, put your monitor where you want that to be, which is right above, uh, right at the eye line, right at the top. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jesse. Uh, your wrists will tell you very quickly if it's at the wrong height. And one thing that I do with my standing desk is I've got this uh, laptop stand to keep the keyboard at a downward angle. I found that when I'm standing, typing is easier if I'm uh, tilting my hands downward. Hey, go ahead, Bill. My s- system is take your natural stance, put your elbows at 90 degrees, measure where your fingers are, add two inches to that. That's where I want the top of my desk to be. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to make a joke about going to a bar and ordering a beer, but I will say this. Uh, I have many times been at uh, hotels where um, the receptionists are have a standing position. And if you what you really want to look at is the angle of your wrist. Uh, one time I was watching a woman typing and her wrists were cocked back like this uh, because her desk was too low. And I, and I was watching it and it, it was actually painful for me to, to sit there and watch her type. So I said, excuse me one moment. And I took a stack of something and I said, can I do something? And I put it under the, the leading edge of her keyboard, which tipped her keyboard, like at a sort of uh, uh, reclined, if you will, you know, cause the top of the keyboard was lower and her wrist just straightened out. And immediately she went, Oh my God, that's so much better. Like, like, like it never occurred to her to try to modify her working environment. She just figured this is the, you know, this is the life I've chosen. This is the life I live. Um, definitely look at the angle of your re- wrists. 
and uh, whether or not you want to rest your hands on the uh, your forearms. I actually work with my forearms on the desktop. That's the way I prefer to work. Uh, next question. From Brett Bilal in Appleton, Wisconsin. When Chris Fenwick showed his OBSBOT camera view, I thought I spied a Korg Nano Control 2 sitting on his desk. How would a Nano Control 2 fit into daily workflows at the office and workstation versus how it's used in a live event? Go ahead, Chris. Do you have a Nano? I, I didn't raise my hand. Uh, yeah, I do. It's right <laughs> over here. Uh, the, I, I don't know. I don't know. What, yeah. This this is uncomfortable. No, uh, the Nano Control controls the uh, the Mix Pre, which is over here. Um, and it's uh, quite handy because a Mix Pre, I have a Mix Pre 6, has four input gain knobs. And the Mix Pre 6 has six inputs, uh, both USB and analog. And you can mix and match those. I actually have control over inputs through the Nano Control that the uh, Mix Pre doesn't have control over. So it's super handy. There you go. And, and is that a monitor next to you that's um, 90 degree turned? Yeah. I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Chris. But you, you're you really sync. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so this is... Uh, uh, sorry about this, too. Um, it is... Uh, I use it for scripts, and I also use it for all my switching matrix stuff. Uh, you know, the ATEM and the OBS and blah, blah, blah. Seems like we have to have another behind the scenes of everybody's kit at some point in the uh, in the next quarter. Just so we haven't seen. I don't think we've seen Chris's. Or maybe I, maybe I'm not. I, I end up I used to have every a, single. I used one. to have an angle over my shoulder, and right. I I turned my room ninety degrees, like I had been talking about, and that's why you actually have that angle out the window now. Yeah. Uh, nice. And uh, the, the vertical monitor wasn't. The vertical monitor is a victim of is a is a byproduct of COVID. Uh, when when uh, COVID happened, and I didn't have to share the, my workstation with anybody, I started tweaking it out mm -hmm. uh, in ways that I didn't think other people in the office would appreciate. And I had always wanted a vertical monitor for scripts, and I go. I really like it. It's good. Awesome. Okay. We're now changing subjects to our second hour. We have David Paskin here to talk about uh, Keynote and Canva. And David, do you want to give us a little overview of what you're talking about today? I'm happy to, sure. We uh, have a lab coming up. It's going to start tomorrow. Um, now, what I'm about to say is probably sacrilegious to most of the people here. Uh, but as, as the resident dummy here, I don't know how to use Unreal Engine, Photoshop, all those fancy schmancy programs that can create the most amazing graphics in the world. And so I'm looking for, uh, for myself and for people like me for tools that will allow us to do sort of basic creative work. And for me, Canva and Keynote have, have really filled that, that need. Um, it's, it, it's allowed me to, to, get creative in ways that I, that I didn't think that, that I could. So Canva is, um, Canva is an interesting, uh, um, app. Canva was really created with the idea of let's focus on visual arts. Let's, let's really allow people to express themselves in visual ways. And so it started just as a way to create basic graphics. It has grown tremendously since then with a lot of functionality like docs, like whiteboards, like uh, presentations, video. And even since they've added all of those, they've actually beefed them up quite a bit so that, for example, video is much more, it's still not fantastic, but it's much more usable now than it was when they first started working with video. Keynote, we've already met a few times and talked about Keynote. It's incredibly powerful. But for this lab particularly, what I want to focus on is not how do you create a slide deck. I was actually considering making a slide deck for, for this, and then I decided that would be a terrible idea. Slide decks are fine, but I'm using these tools in different ways. I'm using them for live production. I'm using them for live streaming. I'm using them to create backgrounds, foregrounds, bugs, lower thirds, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, pre and post roll, um, animated, things like that, uh, cover art for videos. And if you need to throw something together real quick, 
Canva and Keynote, they have different areas of strength, but they really have something pretty powerful to offer. Uh, and also, as uh, Terry found out this morning, I saw on Discord, Discord, they have some fun little things also, which we can get into. But so this is the 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 second hour where we're going to kind of lay the groundwork for um, and answer some questions about some of the things that we can go into deeper depth on uh, during our lab, which is going to be Wednesdays. I don't know the time UTC, but it's 430 Eastern. And one of the things that you're going to see us do more and more as we go into this year is do what we're doing here, which is uh, is talk about something in, um, in um, a second hour with a lab coming up the next couple days or the next week so that we can have kind of an overview and talk through those things. Um, and then we can also have a, uh, um, you know, but we can also dig into it and you can actually ask questions and try to work with uh, the person on that, on that project. Go ahead, David. Nope, just that, that let's, let's jump into some questions. Let's jump into some discussion. Okay, let's go to the first question. From Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asked, Liberty White did an awesome job on Canva and Canva had a great deal on a year's subscription at the time with the add-on Teams, which would allow five users. So using Teams, can five users share one license? Um, I'm gonna feign ignorance here, and, and but there's a specific reason why I'm doing that. I have found Teams in Canva to be very confusing. Um, I, um, and it, it, let me take a, a step back. So. Organize, organizing your your content or your creations on Canva, it you can just, like with most others, like in Google, for example, you can just have a stream of all of your things and you can search for them. You can also um, have folders. On the left-hand side here, you can see I've got some folders going on. I have two teams that I'm a part of. I've got a personal team and I've got this other team for some teachers that I work with. It's entirely unclear to me how I move items from one team to another. So I have really stayed away from teams to be perfectly honest with you, because I just find it very confusing. But I don't think that you can, I know for a fact that you can invite people to your team and they don't need to have a pro account. They cannot though download or export pro elements without a pro account, just because they're on your team. Let's go to the next question. Hey, I'm, I'm Bill. I'm trying to get a hold of you there. I, I'm having some technical issues here because of the storm. There's something going through right, through my system right now. So I'm just going to hand that off to you. Go ahead. Go. Let's go Copy to that. Question. No problem. Yeah, thanks. All right. Next we'll question win. from right. Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida. How many fonts are available and licensed to design with in Canva? Uh, Rabbi, take it away because we have nobody else. Sure. Um, so as of 2019, there were uh, well over 130 fonts in there. Um, and I'm sure that that has grown since then. One of the interesting things that Canva offers is uh, apps. And so you can, you can bring in apps, you can use apps that contain fonts of their own, bring those in, and then those fonts are added to what you're able to use within the program itself. Um, so, David, does it reach in for system fonts? So are any of the fonts that you have loaded available to Canva or do you have to use Canva fonts? I believe that's just Canva fonts. Let me, I'll, I'll show you just by way of example. So I'm going to just start a, uh, we'll just do a, an Instagram post. I'm not showing you anything. Sorry about that. Uh, so if I want to bring in some text, what it's going to have on the left-hand side here, it's going to have a whole bunch of different um you know, presets, if you want to use these, these are essentially just fonts and text that they've applied effects to, um, but they've pre-done those for you. You can also just add uh, heading, subheading, uh, or a little box of text. And these, uh, for me, are actually branded. So you can create brand kits within Canva, and then by it will, by default, uh, assign the, the uh, font, the color, whatever you choose, to create these different headings. But if I just add a text box here and I type in office hours, I'll make that bigger in a moment. You see up here in the top is where all my fonts live and then pop up on the left here. And I mean, there are 
hundreds of fonts. You can upload a font also down at the bottom. If you have a font of your own, you can upload it and add it. I don't believe, I could be wrong about this, I don't believe they're, they're using system fonts, so I think they are their own. But if you have a client who has a corporate font, you can bring that in. Absolutely. That's important. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, sounds like we're ready for the next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia here to ask David, can you share the advantages of using both Canva and Keynote? Go ahead, I'll try. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, 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 I'll share how I use them. So they have, in many ways, they have very different skill sets. I have found Canva to, do, to be very good at static images. So, uh, and for inspiration. Can, a static images and inspiration. So let me give you an example. Um, yesterday, I met with a gentleman I'm doing some work with in um, Australia. He has a charity. Um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. He has a charity called, um, uh, what, what's it called? Sh um, Super Tees, Super Tees. And um, he has not created a logo or anything like that. And he was going to go to Fiverr, which I think is a great idea to have, or definitely have a professional do it. But I said, why don't we start just by throwing some ideas around? So the idea behind this charity is that it's, it he creates specialized shirts for children who are getting treatment in a hospital. For any of you who have I hope none of you have, but if you've been in a hospital, you know that they have to have easy access for ports, for IVs, things like that. And the gowns that they make you wear are really not flattering. And so he makes these cool, he actually has a branding, a licensing deal with Marvel. He makes these amazing t-shirts for kids and then gives it to them. And he's looking for a logo, something like that. So what we did is I just went into uh, the design tab in the top here and I searched for superhero. And it gave me a whole bunch of different options here. We grabbed one of these options. Now this is gonna bring in a full, um, you know, a, a ready-made post, if you will, but these are all elements. So I could just delete these different elements. I could leave this little girl here if I wanted to. And then I can add on top of this, um, let's add some text and we'll say um, super, Tease. I don't actually know if that's how he spells it, but we'll go with like that. So very quickly, right, I'm able to come in here and make a, a, a um, I can, let me just change this color to match the colors. It will pick up, by the way, the colors of whatever image is in here, which is nice. So you can see down here, it actually sees this is the image and it's grabbing all the colors from this image. So if I want to do contra contrast something with that, since I'm going over her, let me make it a little smaller. Maybe what I would do is use the one of the blues from the back, right? So now I've got a incredibly basic, but an interesting idea of a way that we could go with this logo. I could add a page, I could do another sample down here. So we could brainstorm together, creating all of these, these static graphics that may inspire us, or we may be able to share with Fiverr um, or professional graphics artists who are able to then take some of the ideas and do it much, much better than we can do in Canva. Keynote, I think, is better at doing animations. So, um, in Canva, you can animate different elements of uh, what you create. I find it not flexible at all, really. They've just released an update to it, which may allow us to do a little bit more, have a little more fine tuning, but it hasn't been fantastic for me. So for example, when I came in and I threw those graphics up on my screen, this is a keynote that I have here. And we all know, I don't have to tell you all that you can do different um, uh, elements here different fly-ins, fly-outs. You can add delays to them. You can really order things in the way that you want. You can have them stay for as long as you want. You have a lot more control over the animation, the movement of the different elements. And so generally speaking, if I want something that's moving, so I have, for example, uh, an animated overlay that is popping up on, on the bottom of me right now. This was just created in um, Keynote. And all it is is an animated overlay with some delays in there. I have it on repeat and it sits in uh, in my production um, uh, 
program and it comes in as an overlay. If I were using something that's static, so if I'm uh, doing, if I'm teaching something, let's say we just celebrated Hanukkah, right? So I'll bring up some jelly donuts. If I'm bringing in a, um, a static graphic, this is something that I'm gonna make in Canva. In fact, I was thinking about this before we jumped on and I'll just show you very quickly. And again, this is, you know, graphic design for dummies. This is nothing special or fancy here, but um, this is my business website, which is essentially made into, it's not made in Canva. I don't use Canva as my web host, but all of these images, every single image you see up here was created in Canva. And it does an okay job, you know, it's not terrible. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. It seems like it really does help you shortcut a lot of what would otherwise be time-consuming, simple design tasks. Uh, Tony Mobley has a question here. Tony, no, I, I just wanted to add that uh, I was feeling pretty good about myself un until David did that demonstration <laughs> with Canva and Kino, because uh, I, I'll just share this real briefly, and I guess, and if you guys can see that, that is a a performance and worship service that I did with Canva and Keynote. And what you're looking at is Keynote, but all of the graphics is actually Canva. And so um, this was a performance that we did on the 20, 22nd of January of December for um, Christmas related. And I was feeling really good about myself until until David just did his demo. But um, I, what I want to say is when you don't have access to the high end graphics programs, Canva is a way to be able to get the content that you want for whatever situation you may be using it for. Um, I'm using uh, Canva now as a graphics tool for promotion of conversation with Tony Mobley. So whatever guests I have coming in, I will have um, myself on as host, and then I will have my, my guests or guests if I'm having a panel. And it's not the best in the world, but for me, it is really uh, encouraging and taking what I have been doing to another level. And so I'm very happy with it. And um, the cost for me is, you know, just 12 bucks a month. And I've be I have begun because now, because I'm doing that, the, the, uh, the request from the house of worship has intensified in terms of graphics every, every week. Now I'm doing, so now I have a whole set of, of graphics that I'm having to do for the whole month going out. But I just wanted to say uh, thank you to David and Liberty White for encouraging me to embrace Canva. There you go, David Paskin. I'm glad that you mentioned, Tony, the way that you're using them together, because I that's I didn't mention it, but that's exactly what I did here. So this is, a, as I mentioned, a keynote, and the two images that I have on there were made in Canva. Right. So if, if you go into Canva and you search for um, Keynote, for example, let me bring it back up. Um, if you were to go into Canva and if I were to search under elements for Keynote, it's going to give me a bunch of different things that I could use. And I think, I thought it had it in here, but I, but I guess it doesn't. It has some official logos in here. Um, yeah, it's got the official YouTube. I don't know if, how official those are, but it has YouTube logos. It, of course, has Canva logos. So if you want to use that. And so I created the images over here in Canva and then bring them into Keynote as um, uh, as a way to use them together. So, yeah, thank you for that. And it appears that it has a default green screen background. So I, is keying over your graphic elements over live video an easy proposition inside it? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's like any other key it, as long as you have a good green and and a an ingest system that can that can bring that in as a, a layer on top of your video then that that's how i do it so i've got keynote running on one computer 
which feeds into my streaming computer or my meeting computer, as, as it were, uh, as a camera. And then because I just have that green in the background, I just lay this camera feed on top of my own camera feed and I'm able to, it, it, what's nice about that is that you get all of those cool animations that come with Keynote, you get oh, yeah. to take full advantage of those. Yeah, Makes sense. Sky has a thought. Sky? Once upon a time, we communicated using paper. Yeah, we printed things out. And I re remember getting Photoshop for the first time, but it as a tool was very good at making photo images uh, and modifying them. But then you would take that photo and embed that in a desktop publishing system. And so that's where I'm, I'm, I'm using that compare and contrast question to you as in these tools, uh, as I'm hearing you talk about the, the advantages that they're, they're adding new things into Canva, but it's not the ubiquitous do everything Swiss army knife tool yet. It, it might be soon, but um, where do you use and, or maybe you could expand more on uh, the advantages of creating the content in Canva, but then using your uh, Keynote as your your page maker, your Quark Express, your your place to hold it. Well, I, I would actually suggest that it sort of is the catch all. It is, it does do a lot of everything. It just doesn't do anything terribly well. <laughs> that is to say, if if you are looking to really fine tune, really work carefully with graphics. Canva is not going to work for you. But if you're looking to mock something up, if you're looking to throw something together real quick, or if you don't need that level of professionalism, then yeah, it can do a lot of different things. For example, I was, um, my daughter just recently moved uh, out of the country and um, there was a Zoom that was, uh, we were all going to see her and all of her friends. And so I wanted to do something a little special because I'm a loser that way. And so she loves her dog. And so I wanted the dog to be on screen with me. So I took a picture of my dog edit image, background remover, just like in Keynote, Canva does a really nice job, I think, of removing the backgrounds. It can find objects and it will just do it um, uh, relatively quickly. Then you can also go in, you can erase, you can restore, things like that. So there's my doggy. And now I can, and if I make this bigger, you'll be able to see it really did a pretty good job right around the edges. I mean, this, whatever, it's not, per again, right? It's not great, but it gets the job done. And so what I then did is I, well, what I could have done is bring this image, export this image as a download, as a ping with a trans transparent background. And then I can just drag that into uh, Zoom as a, or, or whatever. So um, in some ways, I think it kind of does try and do everything. The, the cute thing that Paul found this morning when he was playing around is um, Canva now is building AI into, um, uh, into their offerings. So what he found was actually down here, if I go into, let's start a, um, by the way, Bill, just cut me off if you want me to stop. Um, no, we got another we, question after this, so keep going for a bit. Okay, great. So if we go down here to, nope, not logos, sorry, apps. So they have an app, called text to image. So I'm gonna go ahead and type that in. If I put, um, let's see, what should we do? A, um, um, a duck um, in the Star Wars movie. Let's just do that. I have no idea if this will work. This is not um, mid journey. I was gonna so say, it's, don't, a, it's a mid journey knockoff, but that's yeah, cool. But don't, don't expect um, anything fancy here, but it's gonna play around with it and you'll have the options to, you know, recreate that again and things like that. And then you can use these and they actually do talk in here about, so here's a duck. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what else they gave us. How is that a duck? That's not a duck. Um, well, like in any said, case, it wasn't all that great. You know, like, like I said, yeah, <laughs> this is a mid journey. Duck. Exactly, this is a mid journey. So there, there are ways to to do AI generated art. The other thing that they, the other way that they're getting into AI is through their new docs. So they launched earlier this year docs, which I was really excited about, and then I immediately fell out of love with um, because of the inability for at least that I found so far to define, to do pagination. Uh, they, they think of this as sort of an inf infinite 
um, like whiteboards and infinite scrolling. And I, I, I like definition. And so, um, but if you type in, let's see, magic, then you can say, um, tell me a story about a duck in uh, the Star Wars movie. And then it'll work for a few seconds and then it'll generate that um, some content. And again, this isn't, you know, chat GBT, but they are playing around with these things. So this is an incredibly long and boring way of saying Sky that I think it actually is trying to be everything to everyone, but again, just not doing it terribly well. Well, again, we're, we're early, oh, we're early days of all this. So yeah. it's they're in the embedding of these new concepts inside of their existing platform. They're trying it. Wow. Yeah. Fenwick has a question here. Uh, to Tony's point, you know, Tony, it was interesting. You said uh, for people that don't have access to some of these tools and it, it you know, you got me to thinking uh, many of us, I, I'm just going to guess uh, everybody raise hand who has uh, Adobe Photoshop on their computer right now. Probably most. David does not. Tony does not. Rashid does not. So, Tony, it's you and me. You no, and no, me, no. Tony. <laughs> uh, th th this is very interesting. So, I mean, Photoshop is a stalwart. You know, we, we've had it for decades. And, and it got me to thinking, you know, I mean, I, I work for a company and we have a lot of tools and we spend a lot of money upgrading our uh, Adobe licenses for all the machines every year. And it got me to thinking, w w would I bother doing that if I didn't do this for a living? W would I, could I live a life without Photoshop? <laughs> uh, and, I, and, I, and I don't know that I could, but I certainly w would consider trying. Also, I want to say, uh, David, you said, uh, it does a lot of things, doesn't do a lot of them well, or I think you said it doesn't do any of them well. Um, I think that a lot of times, and this is just a general um, admonition to all of us and, and anybody watching, many, many times we buy a piece of software, and, and just bear with me here, we buy a $100 piece of software and we get 35 or $40 worth of use out of it because we either uh, don't try hard enough, we don't read the manual, we don't ask enough questions, we don't hit our head against the uh, the wall a little bit harder. And oftentimes we, we get to where we think we can with that piece of software and then we go spend a bunch more money on, on, on something else. And, and we do the same thing with, with, with hardware, by the way. And uh, general admin, admonition to everybody is... Uh, very good chance the software you already have, the tools you already have, can do a lot more than what you're uh, currently getting out of them. Mitchell? I'm kind of with Chris on this, and I think I'd take a little bit further. My concern is that if you make it too easy to do just okay work, then everybody's going to accept that as the new paradigm. They'll be just happy with that because that's what's happening in a lot of things now where uh, the quality and the level of work we're providing it's good enough. So, and I feel that way about iPhones uh, shooting uh, um, major video. As a professional that does design work and I'm an art director, um, I don't like the idea that somebody can substitute subpar work for professionally done work and, tra and, and pass it off as, as good enough. You know, that happened when typography was replaced with, uh, you know, a, a page maker and things like that. And uh, you're probably going to see it uh, sometime with uh, chat GPT. Is it, well, that, that's good enough. We'll take that. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, when I saw what you were coming up with here, David, um, I thought, wow, I see a lot of this on my feeds. I think a lot of people are using tools like this to, um, it's not posterize, it's kind of posterification of the scroll through. So you see a big headline with a photo behind it. It is somewhat sophisticated, but not design. And I just think there's a lot of people using that kind of stuff. Uh, Mitch, let's see, we've mentioned, David, you wanted to talk some more, David, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, Mitch, I, boy, that was um, that was really insightful. I'm, I, I'm really glad that you said that. I, the first thing you made me think about is uh, how that's happened in Zoom how the whole world has become so comfortable with crummy Zoom experiences. And 
uh, and that for some reason we've all accepted those as good enough, as you said. Uh, and I think that, yeah, in some ways, I think you're right. I think that Canva in particular, not so much Keynote, but Canva when used by the masses, I think it, it could be that, you know, Canva, it, before you can download, before you even, um, uh, uh, sorry, not before you download, but right next to download, you can share directly from Canva to your social. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to make this fancy. You don't have to do any importing it into Photoshop to really clean it up. This is absolutely meant to do, I think, Bill, what you said, which is, you know, create something quick and throw it up on social media. Uh, and a lot of folks use it for that. Um, but you're right that uh, if it isn't used well, if you, and there are people out there who really are able to get the most out of this, uh, if it isn't used well, then you're right. It is going to be a subpar uh, uh, product, I think. Yeah, this is, it reminds me of my phrase, uh, it's never been easier to get to 50%, but it's no easier to get from 50% to 100% than it's ever been. And I think that's going to be a rule going forward. A lot of these automated tools makes it incredibly easy to get something that the first time you see it, you go, wow, that's impressive. But then you realize later on, they just use something and click one button and got that thing that you thought somebody had worked a lot on. It falls apart a little later on. Tony, you had a thought here? Yeah, I, I I wanted to disagree a little bit with Mitch from the standpoint that I think that that is true for the larger world, but I think that people in this community never get to the point where they're satisfied with good enough, and uh, we are continued to be pushed. I, I know that I am. I'm continued to be pushed by what this community does. And what it does for me is it continues to push me in with the house of worship that I'm working with and with conversations with Tony Mobley. I'm constantly inspired. And although, as David said, that you can do some amazing things with, with uh, Canva, I am inspired to at some point graduate from Canva and go to the next thing that's going to give me, inspire me. But for most people, they have to have a entry point. And I think that Canva is a great entry point for those people who want to improve and get better. It's easier for me to go from Canva to a Photoshop or something like that than trying to figure out Photoshop. And so, so you're uh, seeing I, it essentially I, as a gateway graphics program. Start here. Exactly. Figure out some basic rules. Let the templates inform you that other people with some skills have put together. But eventually, mo well, I'm not saying, sure most people. You know, a gateway is important for young designers coming in, and maybe it's the 14, 15, 16 year olds who will find this tool, start learning something of the language and become the designers of the next generation. That would be nothing but cool. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, we're having a great conversation and I'm enjoying this. We do have 11 more questions ahead of us. So I'm going to, I'm going to let David have the last word on this and we're going to move on. It, yeah. I, I just want to share that I, Canva has taught me that I'm not a designer. Because having access to all the tools doesn't mean that you're able to create a really good design. There will never be a replacement for someone who is a skilled graphic designer. Yeah, and that's true in so many fields. I mean, typesetting, I, I've been looking at and studying and working with type directors for a long time. I can't do what they do. I just can't. I don't have the eyes and the brain for it. Let's go on to the next question. Next question in from Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. What are the pros and cons for Canva and Keynote to create motion graphics for videos? Mitch, you had some thoughts on that? Well, after hearing what Tony had to say, which I think was very valid, um, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a convert, at least in terms of people that want to experiment and be better. Uh, but I think as you do things like Canva, whether it's for uh, graphics or whether it's for motion graphics, I think you're going to get closer to what would be considered to be good. Just don't stop. Keep going. And um, if you decide you want to stop and hand it over to a, a professional motion graphics designer, that's great. Um, on the other hand, if you're just lazy, 
I'm not saying everybody's lazier, but if you're just plain lazy and that's good enough, don't stop there. We're going to grab a thought from Sky, and then we're going to come back to David to wrap us up since he's our special guest. Today. Well, that's I'm actually I'm going to throw it to David because one of the advantages of uh, Canva is that you can take a concept and then in its ability conform it to different vert vertical presentations for TikTok and those things. So maybe you could throw that into the the conversation, David, because that that's pretty fantastic that you take a horizontal, but now you need it in a vertical, uh, you know, Canvas. Right. Afraid. Yeah. So, um, so let's, uh, I'm going to start with a, uh, this is a, what and that comes here? with the pro account, this, this merging or transforming capability. No, you can transfer. No, you can transform in, in a, a base. So there are two levels of accounts there. There's a standard or basic, and then there's pro, um, some things like background removal, um, you don't get natively in the pro. Um, there are a whole bunch of elements or uh, pro photos that you don't have access to. But as far as resizing, I believe um, you can you can do that uh, in the standard as well. So let me grab. Um, let's just gr um, let's grab a what? What should we grab here? Uh, I don't want a video. I want grab a horizontal and turn it into post. a vertical. Yeah, so let, let's just take an Instagram post and I'm gonna, um, I'll just use this one that I used before. So now what I can do is up here, uh, there's a resize button. Oh, you know what? Apologies, Sky. Um, whenever you see that crown, that means it's a paid uh, feature. I apologize. So this is a pro feature. Click on resize. You can then resize it. You can put in your own dimensions or you can choose um, you know, any of the other things that they have. So if you want to go to a Facebook cover or a, a story or a photo collage, let's do a Facebook cover because that will be, we'll do that. Copy and resize or just resize it. So you can, by default, they want you to not get rid of this version. They want you to make a copy of it, but I'm just going to go ahead and resize it. And then it will automatically resize it for you. Now, everything is not in the same proportions as it was before. So what you might want to do then is come in here, grab everything and, you know, make it a little bigger, move things around. Uh, but yes, that's very powerful. And because Canva has built into it, all of these different social media um, uh, post sizes and graphic sizes and things like that, it makes it very, very convenient. And it looks like from what you just did, that came in as a grouped set of images and you could resize them all in one, which will save a lot of time for some people doing so basic what, graphics. All, right. So all I basically did was I just scrolled down, grabbed them all. I could, if I wanted to, up here in the top right, click group. And now this is one image and I can move it all around. Um, okay, and then I can ungroup and and then yeah. move them individually. So that's very useful. Uh, <laughs> as far as motion graphics, let me, let me just say quickly that uh, again, um, they've made some improvements in Canva in the Canva video. So if you go into Canva and you want to do, let's see, video is right there. They have all the different sizes, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And yes, if you start in something that is a 19 by six, let's actually see. So I just grabbed that one, which is a pre-made one. And now let's resize that for TikTok. Um, where's TikTok? And we'll see. You can see that I never use TikTok. I don't even see it in here. Let's look for TikTok. TikTok, here we go. TikTok video. So this is going to change it to 18, uh, 1080 by 1920. So it's basically going to go from horizontal to vertical and select an option above resize. So again, right, it resized it, but, right, I mean, you can see that that's not really the way we want it. The way they had it, I think, was was sort of down here. So it, and then within the video graphic, you could see this, this lame little timeline at the bottom here. They've, they've done more to this. I don't know how to use it yet because I haven't played with it, but that's why we're having a lab coming up on Wednesday so we can play with this stuff. So Very nice. All right, let's go to the next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Canva has a sleeper app called Magic Write, which is borderline like ChatGPT. Have you tried it? I asked about it, uh, Canvas and uh, Canva and Keynote, and it had excellent suggestions. Thoughts, comments, can you demo? David. Yeah, so we already kind of did the demo, uh, the story about the duck in the Star Wars movie. Uh, then I took this first paragraph, copied it, and I put it into the create an image for us 
Um, so the, the, the story is once upon a time, there was a brave little duck who lived on a distant planet in the Star Wars universe. His name was Quack Quack. And he was, boy, this is really creative, huh? And he was determined to use his wits and courage to make a difference in the galaxy. And then these are the images that it, that it created. This one's actually kind of cute. Uh, these are the images that it created for this. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, I don't know if it's how much of a sleeper it is, um, a sleeper. Um, but again, it does it, it, look. Bottom line for me is these tools, chat, chat GPT included, are all about inspiration. If I am looking for inspiration, I might go to Canva and type something in and it'll spit out a few things that I can look at or chat GPT or magic, right? All these things can give us ideas, nurture and, and, and help us be more creative than we were before. Nisa like quack quack. Next question. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, John Snyder from Reno, Nevada. Can you demonstrate the options available for different aspect ratios and canvas sizes in Canva? David? Sure. There are a gazillion of them. The, the, there, there are a whole bunch that are built in, but you can create any canvas size that you want. So there, it starts with the, the, the layout of the land here is that these are the different types of um, uh, builds that you can do. You've got docs, whiteboards, presentations, social media, videos, uh, print products, websites, and then there's, there's some more here. Um, I almost do everything in presentations, uh, and that's because it gives me by default a nice 1920 by 1080 canvas to work with. Um, but within that, Again, you can change it to anything that you want. You just click on resize. Here's your, here are your, your um, pixels built in, but then you've got Facebook cover, Instagram post. Let's actually go back here and see if uh, infographic, A4 document, YouTube thumbnail. So that defaults to 1280 by 720. I usually always do my 1920. I'm not sure why they, uh, it's lower here. Maybe YouTube um, lowers the resolution. Uh, Facebook posts, YouTube banner, video flyer. A lot of times what I find myself doing, <clears throat> for example, for buy me a coffee, right? Or for um, uh, a website that I'm building. Uh, I may need a banner size that's a specific, or I, I may be told by an app that there's a specific height and width that is recommended for this banner. What I'll more often than not do is I'll come in to the top here, create a design, custom size i'll put in you know whatever the uh the custom pixels are and then it just creates it for me automatically and so i know that i'm building something that's going to be that's going to work with what's recommended by whatever platform i'm, I'm posting it on nice next question next question is douglas carmichael could you use canva for on-screen graphics in a venue david you could certainly create them. Uh, I'm not sure I would, but I think I would. I'd hire Chris to do that. But but you could certainly um, you could certainly create them in Canva. I don't. The the that's a really interesting question. I'm going to so, defend this idea only because what I found is that people who are really talented at design, it, it doesn't really matter what tool you give them. Yeah, they come no, up you're with right. good designs. Right. No, and, you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So it, it depends on the human. So the answer is uh, you can. And thank you for asking that question because I'd forgotten about this. So any uh, anything that you have, let's uh, take let's take this one up under the share option. If you click on share, there is a present mode. So let's click on that. See what happens. Standard presenter view. Okay. So what this is going to do is this is going to turn whatever you have here into basically a, a keynote, but not a keynote, turning into a presentation within Canva. That So uh, presentations within Canva can be presented on a screen. Um, and what this is going to do, if we just click on standard, it's going to bring it full screen for me, basically. Oh, and look at that. It actually it gives me, that's interesting. On your screen, do you have the coming next screen? Like present does in Keynote? No, I don't. Um, oh, there's only one, uh, there's only, let me, let me just create another, 
seen here so that we have two. So share, present. So if I choose, if I chose, oh, there's also autoplay now. If I chose presenter view, let's see what happens now. All right, so there you go. There so you I've, go. Got, I've got, this is the audience window. Drag it to the screen your audience will be looking at and enter full screen mode. Oh, that's interesting. And then on the and bottom, then, you have the next coming up slides. Right, and then over here, I've got notes on this side. I've got the, all the slides on this side. I've got the timer over here. The, you know, this is actually really nice because... It, it's not take like keynote when you go into presenter view, unless you do present in window, it takes over everything. Yeah. Uh, I don't use this for presenting, but this is really nice. So, yes, the answer is you can. Um, not super techy, you would just drag this over to the, the projector or the screen where, where that's showing. Very nice. And Fenwick, did you weigh in? Yeah, on this? It's kind of, I was going to say it's kind of an open ended question. You know, can you use this to do graphics in a venue? Uh, can you? use a hammer to build a house yes uh but you have no idea what kind of house that is so th it's it's interesting but david i want to point out uh because that this that what we just saw there was this presentation <laughs> slowly creep into becoming a lab um Sorry. but it, no 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 it no, was don't it be. was That's super fabulous. interesting because what we found and I, and I want to point this out and i and i know i sort of beat this horse but it's it's worth talking about what we just saw was you discovered a feature of this software that you didn't know existed. And the feature was, can you use Canva as a presentation app? Now, I want to point out what you've been doing. What you've been doing is creating a bunch of graphical elements, downloading them, because this is a, 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 a web-based thing, storing them on your hard drive, uh, putting them in a folder, organizing them on your desktop, uh, importing them into a, a keynote presentation, and then doing all that work there. Look, you're so smart, uh, you created a whole bunch of extra work for yourself. It, as it turns out, it looks like you could have done most of that inside Canva. And this is a common problem. This is exactly what I was pointing at. Uh, talking about where we get to the point where we think we understand something and we stop learning and we stop learning. And, and what ends up happening is we work to our, and, and I will be the first to admit, I'm totally guilty of this. You know, uh, what's the line, you know, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, if the only tool in your toolbox is keynote, everything looks like something that is going to go into keynote. So it, it's super interesting. We literally just watch it happen. And David went, oh, wow, this is interesting. And you could be, dra you could be dragging your Canva presentation onto another display, which could be just an HDMI output into your uh, ATEM, or how I, I, I don't know how you're mixing all your stuff. You said you're using multiple computers. You might be able to do all this on one computer. So I, I just want to really stress uh, we really need to encourage people to actually learn the software and hardware we currently are using at home. Let me take it a step beyond that even. <laughs> I th I'm amazed by the fact that we have an environment here at Office Hours where David, who is excellent at these presentations, felt confident enough to leave any sort of pre-canned program and go exploring in areas where he hadn't tested it 35 times, knowing that if something went wrong, this community is extraordinarily accepting of that. We'll go, that's cool. Maybe we'll learn something else in that diversion. I just, I, I, I'm constantly every day amazed at this whole office hours thing because we just seen a, a perfect example. Get a great presenter who's willing to take a chance, let him do it live in front of an audience who accepts imperfections, knowing that we might discover something that's even better than what was planned. And that's pretty cool. Sky, you had a quick thought? The observation that I'm seeing as this new tool is becoming available, uh, I'm finding that I'm using my old uh, theories, the old concepts, the, as you said, uh, the, the ideas of good design and communication with, with humans. So David, have you, in even using the AI, are you, are you training it or is it training you or both with these new uh, tools? David? Yeah. I, I'm sure it's it's doing both. Absolutely. So I, I'm, <laughs> Chris, wow. Yeah. 
Um, so I just, that slide that I had made in- I saw uh, you pull up a graphic. Did you play yeah. that out of Canva now? So, so this is now, so let me uh, get out of this. And there so you go. the same thing that I just did over in Keynote, I can do much more simply in Canva. Yeah. Wow. See? It's an exploratory you're, space. You're, you're welcome, well. David. A presentation but, space. But, but I will say that what you were doing is what the vast majority of us would do. We lean on the, on the ladder that we know, and we bring everything to that when, you know, the guy down the block has a scissor lift that you could climb up into and get to the roof quicker. Um, it's very, very easy to back ourselves into that corner. And I, and I say that because for literally the last 40 years, that's how I've made a living is, is just using the tools that I know. And I know for a fact, I'm going to age out of all this stuff. And some young kid is going to come up with some whatever and do everything that I do with my After Effects and Final Cut and Illustrator and blah, blah, blah. And he's going to do it on his phone. You know, I'll tell you, I, I want to tell a quick story. Um, our family, uh, somebody had a photo and there was somebody in the photo they wanted to get rid of. I can't remember. And my wife's like, oh, my husband can do that. And I looked at it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, I could. And my, my nephew's wife said, oh, I, I, I could do that. Now, she's, she's a baker. She's a master baker. She makes amazing cakes and the, her, her decorations are unbelievable. But I watched her go sit in the corner on her phone and just click, 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 click. And she was patient. She was diligent. She was tenacious. And when she was done, she cut somebody out of a picture that I would have had a really hard time doing in Photoshop. I'm not that good in Photoshop, but I would have had a really hard time doing it in Photoshop. And she's used, and I said, what are you using? And she goes, oh, it's this app on the iPhone. It's, I can't remember what it was. Time you gotta, you gotta learn your tools. And thanks, Chris, without your comment, this would never have happened today. Let's go on to the next question. Okay, before oh, we oh, yeah, do, go ahead, David. Yeah, sorry, I just yeah. want to, I, I just want to, so this is, everything you said is true. And there is, there are limits. So I'm, still, you know, trying to do this here. And I got this to type in so, so that, that animation. I got this to do something. This guy over here, I wanted to, I don't know, I chose tumble, right? And on the left-hand side, I can choose, I want to enter or do I want to do it on enter and exit intensity. But if you watch, it's shooting over from the right. I have no way to tell it to shoot in from the left which is to me a real limitation. Yeah. I, I want to be able to control how things move. And in Keynote, I can do that here. I can't. So now I, what I, you could do though, is change your copy to Keynote and Canva instead of Canva and Keynote and just swap the logos on the other sides and you'd be fine. <laughs> Clean show, David. Clean show. <laughs> All right. Let's move to the next question because we actually have seven more to get through. All right, John Snyder from Reno, Nevada asking, what format do graphics from Canva typically download as when importing into Keynote? Um, yeah, so you have a few different options when you download. Um, you can, uh, obviously, if there are moving elements in here, it's going to default to MP4 video, but you can do JPEG, PNG, uh, or PDF, One of the th or SVG, excuse me, um, or GIF even. See, is there anything else? No, that's it. So if you have moving elements, you could, you'll, GIF will pop up and uh, MP4 will pop up. If you don't, then you'll get JPEG, PNG, or PDF. One of the things that has people been talking about in the Canva world is how do you uh, make elements that you download uh, clickable so that you can have um, parts of your uh, design that have that go to different links. That's only possible on PDF. You have to download for PDF. Fundam basically, if I'm going to be using something for web or for online, I'll download it as a ping. If I'm printing something out, I'll download it as PDF print. Great. Next question. Next one in from Paul Terry Wallace from Austin, Texas. Canva has a family of apps. 
Which do you find the most useful? For example, band, brand fetch, Pixton, and add Google Maps to your designs, etc. And are there any geared towards Keynote? David, have you played with these? I've played with a few of them. Um, they have a, a QR um, generator, QR code generator built right in, which is really nice. Um, I, these are not, uh, what's it called, how you can um, change the URL? These are static, I believe. Um, so I don't know that you can, let's see here, actually, let's see, office hours. It's kind of cool how you can see it. Oh, I'm not showing you, I apologize. How you can see it change as I do this, dot global. Um, generate QR code. Oh, you can customize it so you can change the color if you want. It's kind of neat, actually. Um, and then it will pop that right in. So that's a nice feature to have, um, especially if you're creating an overlay for uh, that you want to throw on screen or something. That's a nice thing to have. Uh, they also have, let's go back to these, uh, to the apps again. I've also used... Um, there's Google Drive integration, which is nice. There's YouTube integration, which is nice. Um, I, I don't use a lot of these. There's, there's Giphy, so you can sort of find and, and, um, and pop GIFs in. I haven't used a lot of these, um, but uh, they're, they, they're, this marketplace is growing. And that's in part because Canva is huge. The user base for Canva is just enormous, whether it's the best app or not, the user base, because of how easy it is, is huge. And so the app market is growing as well. I will say I've had clients ask me to make entire internal presentation videos out of GIFs, and it's worked really well. I wouldn't broadcast them or anything like that, but it's fun. Next question. Dean Sarah from West Lynn, Oregon. Comment, Canva will provide free access to a pro account for nonprofits 50C3s. There you go. Uh, David, has that been your experience? You're not. So Absolutely. Yes. And yes, and they have EDU accounts. They have nonprofits. Yeah, they're very supportive of that. Okay, next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, how well does Canva on a PC with Windows integrate with Keynote on a Mac platform? What is the workflow in this case, and how does it differ from the native Mac workflow? David, can you do it in a minute? We've got about three more. So it, the, the, Canva does have native apps that you can download. I, don't, I haven't because it works just fine on the web for me. Um, if I had to guess, uh, it, it's basically a web app that you're downloading onto your computer. And because of that, it doesn't matter whether you're on a Mac or a PC, you're going to have the same, you should have the same functionality. You're going to download it, throw it into Keynote. So that shouldn't be a problem uh, at all, I think. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, is Canva the click art, clip art library of our era, or does it have a unique selling point? Go ahead. It, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, when you're creating a, um, uh, a design, one of the uh, things you can do is, so let's say we're, uh, we'll stick with the duck, right? And, and you're looking for clip art of a duck. You're right. I mean, you, you can... This is a great place to just grab clip art. <laughs> What's unique about it though, is that once I have this clip art here, get rid of this, you see up at the top here, I now have, I can play with this. So I can change the colors. So if I would like a blue duck instead of a yellow duck, I can change that there. Um, so that's one of the pieces of this is that almost every element that you have access to that's built into Canva, you can even their own logo, I believe. Oh no, this is sorry. That's a that's an animated, so that won't work. Let me see if I can find a um, a static Canva image. Here we go. So here's the difference: photos versus elements. This duck is an element. This right here came in as a photo, and so you can't change photos, but you can change clip art or elements, as they're called over in Canva. Great question, though. Nicely done. We are at the end of the hour here where I'm going to try to get out sort of on time. I uh, just want to remind everybody, first of all, thank you, David. Fabulous presentation. I learned so much today. That was exceptional. Uh, we'll do our credits in just a second. Uh, previews, though, don't forget that David, I think, is doing his live thing on Wednesday. Wednesday is also Audio Mixer Fundamentals on the show here. A Thursday focus on lens lenses, Friday understanding digital first events, and Saturday chatting about AI. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Without you, we could not do this. Thank you to 
to everybody who is watching the show, our producers. We need your questions. And you once again have come in through with a marvelous group of them. And don't forget to watch the credit roll here at the end. All these people are helping make the show. Thank you all. Let's go ahead and roll credits today. David, that was an outstanding presentation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Oh, what is Mitch showing off? Uh, a large box with uh, connectors on the back. Yamaha Rev 7. I love boxes. I with dragged connectors. my Zephyr out for the second day, so I just want y'all to know. Oh, was... yes. This is Telos Zephyr outside of the rack. This is what we used to have to do to be able to do voiceover on the web for clients yeah. around the country. This is my first time whispering after a show. It's very exciting. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> David, I love that you figured out how to do that all inside of Canva. That was fun. And look at that. We're out on time. Thank you, everybody. See Thank you, you so much, guys. That's good. The Canva Whisperer.